We're live. Well, uh, good morning, late, good late morning here. Uh, welcome to um, the Reactive Spring session. Um, we had to turn the sessions around, as you might have noticed. Originally, my Spring Framework 5 talk, the one that follows after lunch, was meant to come first, and then this one. Uh, but we're happy to switch the order, since one of us has to disappear right afterwards. Sorry. Um, all right. So this session is a demo session. It's uh, uh, live coding, no, no slides other than these few words here, which barely qualifies a slide. So <laughs> what are we talking about today? It's also a photo uh, Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want photo first, most important things yeah. first, sorry. Priorities, people, priorities. Yeah. Okay, everybody, on our marks, get set, say open source. Cheese! <laughs> Woo! Uh, Thank right. you. So, okay. And Z. <laughs> we only have 45 minutes, so we have to do the most important things first, otherwise we don't get to them. All right, uh, so Reactive Spring is a, um, uh, is a key topic in the Spring Framework 5 mission, of course. Um, who's uh, anyone already familiarized themselves a little with uh, Spring Framework 5? Who's already tri tried Spring Framework 5 at least? It's awesome. A anyone using it in production already? Spring Framework 5, Spring Boot 2? All right, nice, nice. Uh, anyone having Rx Java experience, maybe? Or at least some, some oh, no, wow, OK. That's more than usual, actually. Um, so th this is basically where we're coming from. In Spring Framework 5, we um, embraced a, a totally different um, perspective on modern day web architectures. We started introducing something that we call Spring Webflux, which is kind of a parallel web stack, a web architecture of a different kind next to the servlet-based Spring MVC. Uh, this is already a very important differentiation, right? Uh, it's not one web stack pretending it can do both. Uh, there, there is a very fundamental architectural decision underneath uh, that actually has its roots like 20 years back. Anyone remember CGI <laughs> in the late 90s? <laughs> Who's programmed CGI? Uh -oh. I, I certainly have uh, at those times in the late 90s. That's where the, uh, the Servlet API grew out of, basically, was modeled uh, uh, along. The uh, CGI, of course, was like, let's invoke a, a process right, for every single HTTP request. And the Servlet API was already a great step forward. Uh, let's only own a thread for every single Servlet request, right? Have a shared container with a shared architecture. And uh, for every single incoming web request, HTTP request, we assign a thread, and we own that thread for processing that request for those purposes until we're done, which is uh, nice for the times, but it is a quite artificial abstraction. Let's remind ourselves that the underlying network stack, and in particular, all the layers uh, involved there, including the operating systems themselves, are kind of uh, asynchronous by default, asyn asynchronous in nature. They uh, uh, socket programming, right? Anyone ever programmed TCP sockets in the late 90s, maybe? <laughs> um, it's kind of asynchronous by default. It's event-driven. It's callback-driven. So the, uh, the uh, servlet model is kind of a sort of um, artificial abstraction, right? A very convenient abstraction on top of how the network stack underneath actually works. So with, a, with the alternative to it, right, a reactive web stack, we're revisiting the problem, right? The, the, the architectural uh, challenge from a more um, a more network stack oriented perspective. Like, let's model our web endpoints, our web processing code, uh, the way that the uh, the network stack actually works. The um, uh, the programming model has to be different. There's no way you can adapt a servlet like uh, programming model as is. Onto a, onto a reactive stack. Reactive stacks use an event loop. So the differences start uh, at the very fundamental setup. How are we going to use the threads that we get from our, our virtual machine, from our operating system? In a servlet stack, we are all used to setting up 50, 100, 150 threads in the container thread pool on a machine that has maybe like eight CPU cores, right? In, a, in an event loop-based architecture, you would set up Eight, maybe plus a bit, right, for the, for the actual threads, but ideally the same as the actual underlying hardware resources um, allow for, to have as much CPU locality as possible. So um, 
an incoming HTTP request. It's basically consider the sort of event, let's try to do something with it, identify what we need to do with it, then uh, register it with our HTTP kernel, and uh, whenever we are ready to take the next step, whenever the incoming request can be fully read, whenever the outgoing response is ready to be written, we get callbacks to trigger the next iteration. This is what, in, in particular in the JVM space, is being called reactive streams. So we consider the incoming HTTP stream and the outgoing HTTP response stream, the request stream and the response stream, as a uh, asynchronous callback-driven, back-pressure-driven um, streams. So the idea is that we are never, ever blocking when we're trying to read from a stream or write to a stream. We react to the stream's state. The stream basically allows us uh, to, to um, take the next step when it's ready. And in particular, in the reactive streams world, a reactive stream subscriber is in charge. It's always uh, the subscriber kind of asking the publisher, for example, the, uh, a data store driver, right, uh, to kind of uh, hand it over some, some data uh, to process. So it's a totally different way of operation underneath the covers. Reactive streams publishers, reactive streams subscribers, subscribers are taking a few elements and uh, getting asynchronous, never blocking callbacks uh, to process them when they're ready. Now, back to the level that we're on today, we are primarily showing you what the programming model looks like. And the programming model is different, but it's maybe not as different as you may feel it will be. So let's get right into it. Uh, we are on Spring Framework 5 and oh. Spring Boot 2. Um, this time, actually, everything is GA, right? <laughs> um, so I, we are going to start with uh, our favorite web page, right? Yeah. Isn't that Josh? Right? Second start favorite page. Start and create a reactive Spring Boot 2 application. All right. So we have uh, very little time. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application. Here is start.spring.io. This is, of course, uh, my second favorite place on the internet, and I'm sure it's uh, Jurgen's as well. Uh, first, of course, being production. The goal here is to build a very simple application using Spring Boot 2.0.1 and uh, uh, all the bits that that incorporates, including Spring Security 5 and Spring Data K and uh, Spring Framework 5 as well. So we're going to build a new application today. Uh, just the same old demo, I don't, same old domain uh, as every demo, you know, just this reservation service. Don't want to don't linger too long on that. Uh, we're going to use Kotlin, partly because we can co-locate everything in Java. We can write Java code, and the, primar you know, the majority of it can be in, in, in Java, but we can have occasional Kotlin examples where it suits us. And we're going to build an application here using uh, uh, the reactive web support here, and this is different from the web support in Spring Boot. This is the Spring Web Flux uh, you know, module that Jürgen just uh, introduced. We're going to use uh, Reactive MongoDB. We have a number of different persistence options here, Reactive Cassandra, Reactive MongoDB, Reactive Redis, uh, Reactive Couchbase. All of them are fine choices, but uh, notice that we're not using a Reactive JDBC offering here, right? There's, a, there's hope, there's I have optimism uh, that at some point there's going to be a Reactive JDBC thing eventually, but for now, I, I don't think it suits us to have a facade around something fundamentally blocking. Is that yeah. fair? There, there are ways out of this, right? Uh, you can set up a worker thread, pull and pass like blocking operations like JDBC and JPA uh, operations to them. But fundamentally, uh, you're doing yourselves a favor <laughs> by starting from the bottom. If you have a reactive uh, data store driver, expose its power through your application, through your system, up uh, to the web endpoints. This is what uh, a true WebFlux server stack and an event loop based WebFlux server stack is about. Exactly. So there's that. We're going to use the reactive MongoDB. Uh, I have that running on my local machine as well. Uh, we're going to use uh, the, what do we want to use? We're going to use uh, reactive MongoDB, reactive web. Um, do we want anything else? I think we can use reactive security. We can use Spring Security 5. We might get to that. Who knows? Uh, we can do that. Uh, we might use the gateway, Spring Cloud Gateway, but we can comment that just in case if we don't have enough time. Uh, and uh, I think that will be enough. That'll be a very simple application that'll give us a chance to demonstrate a lot of different concepts here. Now, I could switch to the full version here, and I'll see a, an ocean, an ocean of checkboxes, things that I could add to my uh, application if I wanted to. Uh, notice that you know we have all these SQL-based things; these are not going to be particularly useful. We have our no SQL options. Um, a lot of good choices, a lot of, a lot of things that we could talk about, including the larger Spring Cloud and microservices ecosystem. The whole microservices ecosystem is now being reworked in terms of uh, reactive programming. Uh, there are some drop-down menus here, and these imply 
a choice where I think, for now, realistically, there is no choice. The first drop down here is the choice of the Java version. Now, Spring Framework 5, and thus everything that builds on it, requires a Java 8 baseline, right? So you are using Java 8, you're using Lambdas, you're using all this good stuff. Spring Framework 5 itself now has Java 8 code in it, right? Plenty. Plenty. And so the entire code base is Java And does that feel great, mm. being able to yeah, modernize? Yeah, finally, finally, <laughs> uh, consuming all of this good stuff ourselves internally as opposed to just supporting it in applications as we did before is nice. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it works now also with Java 9 and 10, is that mm. fair? Yeah. Uh, but uh, there, there's a, you know, obviously there's some, uh, there's a discussion to be had about whether you should be using Java 9 or 10 if you're not prepared to upgrade every six months. So mm. realistically for now, we'll leave it on 8 and wait for Java 11, which is due later this year. Is yeah. Now, it's fair, fair to say Java 8 is a great baseline if we want to see it from a positive perspective. We can do many things with it. Lots of the story that we're doing in Spring Reactive is Java 8 based. It couldn't have happened on uh, Java 7 or older, you know, without lambdas, without um, method references, without the Java util function package. Many of those programming styles wouldn't be nearly as nice as they are on Java 8. Anything beyond Java 8 has yet to be seen, right? The industry is baselining on Java 8 for the foreseeable future. And of course, we have the choice of packaging. And again, this is, it's very important to, to stress the differences here. Uh, you can do uh, servlet-based, embedded servlet-based web applications using Spring Boot in jars and in wars. And you can do reactive, non-servlet-based active applications using jars and wars, right? So there's a, it's a very strange, uh, you know, um, uh, you can mix and match. But the point is for now, our, for our purposes here now, we're going to use .jar. And uh, we're going to hit generate. That'll give us a new project which will open up here in my ID. And it doesn't matter what ID you're using. I'm going to use IntelliJ. Just curious, how many of you are using IntelliJ? Ah, very good. How about Eclipse? Right, right on, very good, about half and half. What about uh, uh, NetBeans? Also very nice, very good choice. Mm -hmm. uh, very <laughs> awesome, good stuff. <laughs> Lots of good choices. Uh, you just need Java 8 support and maybe Maven or, or Gradle support. So, mm -hmm. you know. Kotlin's a topic Kotlin, these days. Oh, in this case, yeah, Kotlin yeah. would be nice. But there's good Kotlin support. So now, let's go ahead and comment out some of the stuff that we don't need just yet. We'll comment out uh, this stuff right here. These, um, the uh, security, we don't want that right now because it'll, it'll block our application. Uh, we don't want the gateway stuff just yet because it'll, uh, well, actually we don't care about the, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that all there. So we have now a reactive application and we have a, a new uh, a Kotlin-based entry point. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this and we'll just start from Java, okay? So the nice thing about Kotlin-based projects, which, which the Spring Boot initializer supports, right, is that when you write code, uh, you can just co-locate Java code next to it. So I can say reservation service application, and this will be my entry point. It'll be in Java so that the majority of our time together we talk about uh, Java. Public static void main string args, all right? And uh, Spring application dot run reservation service application args. All right, there we are. So there's our entry point. And what we're going to do is we're going to build an application that manages data um, of type, uh, you know, a document that's going to be mapped to a database to a document in MongoDB of type reservation. And we're going to create, a, uh, you know, some fields here. So private string ID and private string reservation name. All right. And uh, we'll have this basic entity. Now, of course, this is Java. So, you know, unless you're using Kotlin data classes or Lumbach in Java, you need to create getters and setters and uh, equals and, you know, all that and uh, uh, two strings and, oh boy, so succinct, such productivity. So, we, there we go. Now, uh, we're going to create a, uh, we have an entity and I want to be able to persist entities of this type into the database. So, I'm going to create a reservation repository and this uses uh, reactive Spring data. So we're going to create a reservation repository here. A reservation repository. Uh, sorry, a reactive Mongo, Mongo repository. And the reactive Mongo repository is going to manage entities of type reservation whose key is of type string. All right. Now, this repository provides all the normal CRUD style methods to create, read, update, delete data, etc. But you notice that here, they, while it looks fairly familiar, there's a couple things worth understanding, a couple things worth focusing on. First of all, we accept a publisher. This is the Reactive Streams publisher. A publisher uh, emits items. It, it emits records asynchronously. A subscriber is the thing that consumes those records. When a subscriber subscribes to a publisher, it is given an on-subscribe callback 
uh, and it is given a subscription. That subscription represents the link between the publisher and the subscriber. It is the connection, the session between the two. And the subscriber can use the subscription to say, look, I cannot handle more than, say, n number of records, 10, 20, a million, whatever, whatever you're able to handle in one, one, uh, one transaction, basically, one uh, you know, safe amount. This way, there's no risk that the publisher drops uh, you know, 10, terabyte, 10 terabytes of data on the subscriber when it's not ready, right? It can, you don't want to overwhelm your subscriber. This is how you guarantee that the subscriber moves no faster than it is prepared to move. This is called. This is the back pressure yeah. element that we were talking about earlier. And it also goes the other way around, right? Uh, if a subscriber is asking for data and the publisher is not ready yet, we're not blocking either. Uh, we're waiting for a callback from the publisher uh, when the data is actually ready. It goes in both directions. No overloading from the publisher's side, no blocking from the subscriber's side. Right. So now uh, we've got that um, repository, and now we're going to write some data to the database. We're going to have some sample data uh, in the database, and we're going to do so inside of this bean uh, of type application runner. This is a Spring component. It's just a regular Spring Boot interface that Spring Boot will recognize and then call uh, when the application starts up. So public void run. This will be an ideal place for us to do any kind of initialization of the application when the application starts up. So we're going to use this as an opportunity to use Reactor. Reactor is the reactive streams capable uh, reactive runtime that underpins what we're doing here in Spring Web Flux and all these Spring and reactive modules. Reactor is a separate project that uh, can be used independent of Spring, but we, uh, we uh, enjoy using it through Spring here. So we're going to use this to write some data. And you can see that we have in this repository, as we, you know, as we uh, saw here, we have methods that return two different types of things, monos and fluxes. A mono is a publisher. It implements publisher. It is just a publisher. But it is a publisher that produces either one or no values. So if you see a mono, think of it kind of like a publisher future thing. All right? And then we have a flux. A flux is also a publisher, but it produces zero to a potentially unbounded amount of records. It can produce new records f for the rest, of y the rest of time. As long as there's heat in the universe, as long as the sun is still out, this thing will keep producing records. And that's OK, because it's, it, you know, we can stream and consume the data as it's being emitted. So there's no risk of like, uh, uh, you know, accumulating too much me memory or whatever. Y now, oh you, yeah? you could think about it since there have been so many people with RxJava background. Uh, it's Flux is basically React as uh, flowable in RxJava 2 terms or uh, uh, observable in RxJava 1 terms. And, and uh, Mono would be like uh, single in RxJava terms. Uh, so the essentially Re React is a sort of uh, modern-day Java 8-based server-oriented alternative to RxJava. Just being able to be a, a little bit more specific about its assumptions and about its purpose, where RxJava is very general purpose. Lots of its usage, even RxJava 2 is on Android, right? It's still Java 6 baselined. And with React, uh, we had the the fortunate situation that we could start on a Java 8 foundation. And uh, the uh, Spring 5 and Spring Boot 2 are internally based on Reactor. And many of our standard signatures are also based on Reactor's flux and monotypes. We do understand RxJava types if you happen to pass them to us, right? Uh, but uh, Because they are uh, publishers. Yeah, because uh, when we know how to adapt them to publishers, even if they are not, like in RxJava 1's case. So we, we do have RxJava support, but the recommended uh, programming model for reactive composition is Reactor itself with Flux and Mono as the entry points. So let's create some records here, just some sample data. Uh, we've got Jurgen on stage. We've got myself. Nice to meet you all. I'm Josh. Uh, what else? We need some names. We got Stefan. He's a... We have two Stefans on the team. Might as well <laughs> add them both. Um, and we need some other names. Uh, Miss, what's your name? Margarita. Margarita? How do you spell that? M-A-R-G-A-R-H. R-H? Yeah, A. A? A? R? Y? Like this? Very cool. Nice to meet you. Next. Um, is that not right? Yeah, it's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I can more. barely see. What's your name, my friend? Lionel? Like, like this? Yeah. Like Richie? Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, OK. Two more. Come on. Two more. Huh? Two more. A eight. It's a nice round number. You can divide it by two and then two again. Miss, what's your name? How do you spell that? C. C. Hi. Like that? Very cool. Nice to meet you as well. And um, 
I don't know, just one he, more person. He won't give up, so you have to. <laughs> Who wants to be my next victim? Uh, sorry, volunteer. Um, what about you, buddy? P E T E R? Yes. Very cool. All right, so we now have a publisher uh, full of names, right? This publisher has names in it. It's just, you, can, you can see it's a builder just to build a publisher full of names. And what I want to do is I want to map each one of those into uh, a reservation. So I'm going to take the name like this and I'll turn it into a reservation entity. So the entity, uh, I need a constructor here. I forgot to build that. So build another constructor for that and then build a no argument constructor. Again, so concise, so productive. So there we go. Um, we're going to turn that reservation into a, uh, turn that name into a reservation with a null ID and uh, that'll give us a publisher full of reservations. And now I want to take each one of those reservation publish, uh, items and map them into a saved reservation. So I'm going to say this.reservation repository res, okay? And uh, what do I get when I get when I do that? Well, look at this. This save method returns a publisher. And the map method accumulates the output of this transformation into a, another publisher. So what I have now is a publisher of publishers. And I don't want that. I want to have just a publisher of reservations. So instead, I'm going to unpack the middle publisher by using flat map. Right? So we're using the operators to, to go through this data. And of course, this can be written as a lambda. That's really nice. Now, I have uh, three lines of code. Three lines of code. What happens if I run this program right now? Exactly. Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. You see, this code, quite like myself, is very lazy. In order for it to, be, in order for it to do work, you have to force it. Right? So I am going to say I want to subscribe to the data here. And I, I can use the, the Reactive Streams uh, subscriber callback if I want to, but there are some nice overloads, uh, overloaded versions that come in Reactor. So here, I can say system out dot print line and then pass in the name, uh, the reservation rather. Um, and uh, this is certainly one option. I could also use just a method reference, which I think is cleaner. Uh, and so let's go, let's go ahead and see what happens. If I run this code, I will see uh, some data run, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And this is going to be fine. This will be fine. I'll have some data in the database. Uh, but I'm using uh, reactive MongoDB here. And so it's going to accumulate. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, reactive web application do, do, do I not have? Let's see. Reactive service application dot class. Oh, silly. Spring Boot application. <laughs> I missed the most important yeah. part. It's usually generated, right? It just mm. meant to sh you meant to show it in the hand coded form. Right? Yeah. There you go. So now we have some data. And the data is in the database. That's working just fine. But if I run this program multiple times, I will see that eventually I'll have duplicates of data. And I don't want that. So what I want to do first is I want to say, oh, let's delete everything, like so. But when I call delete all, I'm given a mono of void. Well, that means that I'm going to have to wait for that response. I could subscribe again. I could say, you know, system dot out dot whatever. I could do something to wait for the response, but that's I, that's not the right way to do it, right? What I want to do is I'm going to force this to happen before these lines of code. And as written, this won't work. Whatever callback I use, you know, if I use then or something like that, uh, whatever I do will, uh, will be asynchronous. So I need to force this code to happen first. One way to do that is to use the block operation, which is a terrible idea. Here I have this wonderful reactive code, and I'm introducing an artificial block for no reason. Instead, I need to then compose. So I'm going to say then many. I'm going to say compose uh, this operation with this operation. And the, this operation is going to be what I create here. So let's go ahead and clean up this code a little bit, get rid of the intermediate variables. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have something much more clean that we can then pass uh, to that operation. So take all that, paste that in there. And then I want to say, give me all of the data that comes back, find everything. And then finally, I want to subscribe and print out all the re that records that come back, right? So Yay. there we are, much cleaner. And you can see here, we're using the reactor types to compose these operations together. Any th anything you want to say there, my friend? Well, this is a, for those with our Java experience. This is exactly what you're used to, even in terminology, right? From uh, from uh, uh, Java's uh, language, and uh, Reactor has been very explicitly modeled 
along those lines. So there's a kind of common terminology out there, in particular between ArcGIS-Java and, uh, and Reactor. There's even very active, there has been some very active collaboration that led up to this. Uh, like David Karnak from ArcGIS-Java has been a committer on, on Reactor and very close interaction. So Reactor 3 and ArcGIS-Java 2 have kind of co-evolved. And uh, hopefully it shows in the, the analogies, in the language, in the terminology that is being used there, so that using Reactor feels very natural if you've been using ArcGIS-Java before. Now, the, this is all asynchronous, right? This is important to use these operators because the operators uh, would other, these lines would otherwise be asynchronous. This line may execute on a different thread than this line. That's why it's important to use these, these operators to, to deterministically you know, tell the, uh, the engine when to schedule things and how to do it. This is very complicated asynchronous code. You don't have to use countdown uh, uh, latches and cyclic barriers and, and um, phasers and all that kind of stuff to make this work. The runtime will do that for you. You can even exercise some control over the scheduling of these actions. You can say, oh, I want to schedule this uh, using an executor service that I provide here, for example, right? That is a, you know, here I'm using the option to exercise which thread, which scheduler I use behind the scenes. But normally I just let the, I let the runtime figure it out for me. Now, if I run this program, as we saw before, we should have uh, a, an application that pr prints out the, uh, the data here on the console. So there we are, that worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. <laughs> <laughs> it was always going to work. Mm -hmm. Instead, what we really wanted to talk to you about, and arguably the main reason that any of us are here at DevOps France, uh, is this. This is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. Now, this artwork took a long time to get right, but as Jürgen will attest, we have many people on the team who are PhDs, doctors, people who in their other lives worked in nuclear physics, star stuff, the heavens above us were their daily rumination. So it's for this reason that I'm very happy with our ASCII artwork. This took a long time to get right, but you see, uh, we worked hard, and we, I like the result. It's for this reason that I want to take a, just a brief moment, a brief digression, to talk about what I consider, and maybe Jürgen will agree, I don't know, I consider this to be a very, very serious deficiency in the IntelliJ JetBrains product. For while I'm a fan, I think this is particularly short-sighted. <laughs> Do you see that checkbox? <laughs> the worst feature ever in it's an IDE. <laughs> exactly. It says hide banner. What the hell? That's... That's a dumb feature. <laughs> so I did what all people would have done. I didn't have, nobody had to ask me. I'm not a hero. It's just what anybody would do. I went on the internet and I complained loudly and I sent a message out. And my friend, Jan Sabron, who's a software developer by passion at IntelliJ IDEA JetBrains, responded with this message of hope, which I share with you today, here, now. <laughs> Don't worry, my friends. Hope springs eternal. Now, I'm waiting for that patch to arrive. Uh, I think things are going to be fine. Now, of course, this was 2016, but, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to come. I'm sure of it. <laughs> now, it's, I also want to take a brief moment to talk about what is arguably the most important feature added to Spring Boot ever uh, in Spring Boot 2.0. I mean, this reactive stuff is pretty cool, but mm. really, let's focus on what matters here, Jürgen. Uh, a big feature that we added in Spring Boot 2.0 the best feature, arguably, is the ability to take banners to the next level. So I'm going to create, I'm going to override the banner here, <laughs> right? Copy, <laughs> CD, desktop, misc, copy, banner.txt, downloads, reservation service, source, main, source, main resources. Okay, so that's the, the I'm just copying a banner.txt file into my application. I'm going to go kill this one here. Okay, goodbye to this one. And we'll do maven clean spring hyphen boot colon run. And that should give us an application with updated banner, right? And so again, should you change the banner? Probably not, of course not. You're not gonna be that good, but you know. <laughs> but they're colorful now. <laughs> now, yeah. I understand, I knew that you would appreciate this. This is the place where the Louvre is after all. And so you appreciate fine art. I know that. Now this is, this is an old thing that you could do. You, this is not a new feature. Let's talk about the new feature though. My favorite feature. So I'm going to take this up at the next level. I'm going to make this really small so you can't really see what I'm doing. <laughs> oh man, can you read this? <laughs> Just barely. Can you? <laughs> Good, no. It's important. RM. RF, source, main, resources, All right, so now we'll try again. I've just changed the new file 
to the best feature ever. Uh, wait, 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 wait. <coughs> Activities. Wait, how do I change the profile? Preferences. Theme. Colors. System thing. Uh, Ambiance, tango. Fair, close. Whatever. Okay, so Maven, clean, spring boot, run. And you make it Venice. <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't even care if it takes like 30 seconds to add to my startup time. Don't even care. Uh. Worth it. <laughs> anyway, we're going to go ahead and remove that for now because it is, unfortunately, that is the one thing in, in Spring 5 that is not asynchronous and reactive. So I'll remove banner.gif from my program. Now, we have an application. We've got uh, some data. We've got ask artwork. Uh, life is good. Now, um, are we done? I mean, obviously, I think we should build a, uh, a REST application. So let's go ahead and do that. We can do this the old-fashioned way using at Spring MVC style uh, REST controller. So I'm going to say reservation REST controller. And uh, well, Jürgen, what do you got? What do you got? Well, um, this is one of the, the, the primary usage models, the primary programming models for, for the uh, reactive stack. Uh, this actually suspiciously looks like a Spring MVC controller, doesn't it? I mean. At this point, uh, no get mapping, REST controller, the entire structure. This is a regular spring managed class with uh, the usual stuff, type level stereotypes, potentially auto-wired annotations, maybe on the constructor, and endpoint methods, handler methods with mapping annotations. Really no difference from the spring MVC in, uh, like programming model that uh, uh, you, may, you may be used to, not just from Spring MVC, also from, say, Spring's Stomp support and WebSocket. Uh, um, there, there are many, uh, even from messaging applications, we use the same programming model uh, all over the place. And we do the same here. These are literally the same annotations as in Spring MVC. Um, but there's a noticeable difference. It's the signatures. The handler methods, in, a, in particular on an event loop based stack, need to be fully non blocking, right? So, uh, and their purpose is actually slightly different. We, uh, we receive an HTTP request, we pass it on to the dispatcher handler. The dispatcher handler says, What are the endpoints that we have? It matches them by predicate, the annotations in this case. Um, so, it will find out that this reservation method here needs to be called, reservation flux needs to be called. And the purpose of the method is to build a reactive streams publisher for us, a publisher capable of producing the desired outcome, the desired response. So in this case, uh, we delegate down to the repository. The repository knows how to, uh, to build this sequence of reservation objects for us that are then to be rendered out through a reactive coding model. Think like Jackson-like rendering for certain codecs. Um, and passing them back to the runtime engine. The runtime engine says, OK, thanks. I know how to produce them now. And it registers a corresponding uh, processing chain. So whenever the incoming request is actually ready, when the response can be written, it starts triggering them through a subscription. Um, so this method actually just builds a couple of instructions. right? And that doesn't actually do anything until the runtime engine triggers the next step. This is the whole purpose. Whereas in a Spring MVC endpoint method, the purpose of the handler method is to actually process the request. Here it is just to build instructions for how to process the request. A pipeline, maybe. A pipeline, yeah. All right, so I like this style. And this is certainly fairly familiar, isn't it? But uh, uh, this is not the only thing that we can do now. In, in Java 8 uh, as a baseline, with Java 8 as a baseline, and, and with support like for languages like Groovy and uh, Kotlin, we have this now ability to, to build things that take advantage of, of lambdas in this functional style of, uh, of programming. So yeah, the, the functional API is kind of the, the uh, um, a, a totally different way of consuming the same underlying infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's certainly uh, a little on the unusual end for how you used to uh, build Spring components. Uh, but it's not actually uh, uh, a, a totally brand new uh, style at all. It's inspired by functional programming styles out there, and in particular by functional programming as in Java 8 functional programming. So we're taking a lot of inspiration from um, 
the language features and API features, API styles that Java 8 introduced, and that have been embraced by other libraries and frameworks out there, not least of it all large Java when used in Java 8, or Reactor in particular. So it's inspired by the same model all the way through. So essentially, no annotations, no reflective dispatching, a straightforward composition of what we call router functions and handler functions. Router functions basically being asked to uh, uh, identify which handler function to invoke based on a predicate that matches the incoming request. And uh, the handler function having the purpose of what we just saw as a, like a get mapping method that returns a flux. Handle function is basically the same thing. An incoming server request needs to build a publisher for the server response. And you can see that we have the ability to express a complex predicate, right? This is a, uh, in slight, slightly different from Spring MVC mapping annotations, which are data, not verbs. So the annotations in Spring MVC are they're flexible. They're very flexible. And from the 90% case, they're more than adequate. But uh, what if you want to express a very complex predicate uh, in code, right? You want to express an opinion on which request should be matched. Now you can do that here. You have the ability to plug in a, uh, a matcher, whereas, with, whereas before you would have to go uh, to one level below the Spring MVC component model to do that. So we have this ability to express com complex predicates if you want. Uh, and then we have this. Now this is the Java version of this API. And of course we can compose other you know, calls here as well, like Git and so on. Um, this is the Java version of the code, but uh, it's also very nice to see that there's a DSL in Kotlin that we can use as well. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to go here and I'll build a functional uh, Kotlin application. So we'll, let's say um, uh, class, I'm going to call this uh, uh, web configuration. And we're going to use Kotlin here to express this builder uh, here. And uh, we're going to create a bean uh, of type routes, or of uh, named routes, and it'll be equal to this DSL that comes with Spring WebFlux. Now notice that this is a DSL. It's in the same jars. I didn't have to add anything spe specific to Kotlin. It's in the Spring Framework or Spring WebFlux web jar uh, uh, support. It's like an extra API that's only visible really when you're using it from Kotlin. It's like if you ever play a video game and you find a secret level in that video game, and you know you can, you're the only one who knows about it. This is a secret level that you get if you play in Kotlin. Uh, it works just fine in Java as you saw before, but now you have this nice DSL. So I can say I want to create a handler mapping or a match. Uh, a predicate that matches reservations, and the response I want to send back is going to look like this. So body, and I'll inject the uh, reservation repository there, and I'll say reservation repository dot find all. And there's several nice things about this. First of all, thanks to uh, sort of, um, let's see, what is wrong with you? Oh, mm, yes, I need to make this thing public for Kotlin to see it. So we take this, put it over here, Reservation repository. Okay. So same as before. And now this reservation configuration, uh, well, well it'll, it's my same endpoint, but you notice how much cleaner that is uh, with respect to um, the Java API. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that I don't have to pass in that second parameter. I don't need to pass in a class literal here. You know, th thanks to Kotlin's re inline reified functions, these are basically uh, uh, macros, right? These, these, these function invocations are not actually dispatches to other functions in a class somewhere. They're copied and pasted code at the call site. The compiler inlines a class literal reference. So I don't need to specify explicitly that this is a reservation class. I could, as I have to in Java, I could do that, but there's no need. The uh, Kotlin compiler sees that the generic type is of type T, and it gives us a, a reference to T.class, basically, in the, in the implementation of this code. So we can write that code in such a way that you can get kind of pseudo-reified generics. Not we're, really. Yeah, we're, we're trying to make the, uh, the Java version of this also as DSL-like as possible, but there are certain limits to what we can do in the Java language. Right? Where what you've seen before with the little route and end route and get was using quite a few static imports, right? As you may have figured, route and get was statically imported. So in, even in Java, you can get a, a, a DSL-like experience, but there are certain limits to what you can do, like uh, um, what you can infer from a, from a Lambda expression or method reference is limited in Java, whereas the Kotlin compiler um, retains rich metadata about Kotlin functions at runtime. So in both worlds, we're essentially doing the same thing, but we're doing it to the best possible degree um, against Kotlin, as idiomatic and as concise as Kotlin allows us to express them. So we've seen a couple of styles on how to map the endpoint. Um, now let's run them, right? Yeah. Uh, one of that. them. But uh, just uh, reiterating the point that uh, 
in the end, all you're doing is you're expressing a, a, a route, whether you do, through, uh, do so through metadata or whether you do so programmatically, is essentially just, just a detail, right? And the, all, uh, the, the, the purpose of the annotation-based programming model is a declarative version of this. The purpose of the functional style API here is a programmatic version of it. It all comes down to the same kind of runtime infrastructure underneath. And that's a great indication of what we're trying to accomplish in Spring Framework 5 uh, overall, where it becomes very clear that in the Spring world, annotations are just one way to tap into the framework services. I am rewriting my uh, entity here and using Kotlin because the interop is not going as smoothly as I'd hoped, but it's a uh, easy enough fix. And plus, we get the benefit of being able to use this as just a Kotlin type, and it becomes a. You can see it's much cleaner to express this way. Just in case you wonder why why we do those Kotlin things, compare this one to the reservation class in Java before. Right. right. That's the longest version of this class that I can write. There we go, so that's working. So, and that's actually even, that's not even correct there. Now I get two strings and equals and all that stuff by having the, at da the, uh, the keyword data there. So let's go ahead and restart. Okay, and we should now have nothing. Why isn't that working? Routes, get reservation, sir, blah, blah, blah. Reservation, something. Is so. web configuration actually being picked up? Sorry? Is web configuration being picked up? Well, yeah, because it's saying class not found reservation, which is silly because it's right here. And these are one of those things where I think if I just delete the target directory, everything will be fine. If it's not, well, we'll move on. Um, do I need this? I mean, it's right there. That's a compiler. I can see no, it clearly. You have to do it. There we go. It was literally just, yeah. Okay, cache type. As always, right? If something doesn't work, clean your. <laughs> your workspace and run it right. again uh, it always helps, uh, at least oftentimes. Right. All right, right. so now we have reactive web, web application. We looked at Kotlin a little bit. Now, we have here about four minutes, and I want to just wrap up with one last thing here. Uh, this reactive programming paradigm, we've looked at it in terms of Spring Framework and Spring Boot, and we looked at Spring Data. There is support for Spring Security, reactive Spring Security, for example, because when you think about it, it is traditionally, before um, Spring uh, framework 4 and uh, the servlet 3.1 support, uh, the, the, the support for the current, current authenticated principle that lived in a thread local. And if you wanted to access that from somewhere downstream after the Spring Security filter, you had to go to that thread local. You'd use Security Context Holder to get, get, uh, get, get uh, Security Context and then get the reference there. Uh, well, we have to perpetuate that, that authenticated principle somehow, even in the reactive world, right? We've, we've reworked that code so it doesn't require the servlet API uh, store everything in a th thread local, and we had to do the same kind of reworking for reactive support because, again, there's a decoupling between the, the thread that accepts the incoming request and the one that produces the response. So you have that, uh, that support in Spring Security 5. It works in a reactive world. Um, and you can use the reactive support here in a bunch of other frameworks, right? And there's some stuff that's brand new that only works uh, with the reactive support, like Spring Cloud Gateway which is an API gateway that supports things like rate limiting and proxying and transformations and URL rewriting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, a new project called Spring Cloud Function. Spring Cloud Function is a function as a service framework. It's a framework for building functions that work in a function as a service environment. They can be adapted to whatever function as a service runtime you've got, including Lambda and Azure functions and Google Cloud and all that. Uh, but one of my favorite runtimes is a brand new runtime called Project Riff. Riff is for functions. Riff is for functions. 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 So Riff is a runtime. It's built on top of Kubernetes, uh, and it can, you can. I've got it, I've got Riff and Kubernetes installed on my local machine. You just need a Helm chart, uh, and you can deploy functions to this. So I'm going to go ahead and very create a very quick Spring Cloud function example here, just to demonstrate how. Reactive programming and understanding these concepts helps you in this world. So I'm going to build a, a Spring Java-based uh, 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 function. You could, of course, use any JVM language, inclu including Kotlin. And uh, we're going to build an application here. CD downloads, UAO uppercase. And I'm going to add the Spring Cloud function dependencies. Those, unfortunately, do not exist on the Spring initializer yet, start.spring.io. But that's OK. We can add these bits ourselves manually. like you know, the way that we did it in the past in the old days, uh, before the checkboxes. I don't even remember those days. They scare me. So Spring Cloud function dependencies, 
type is equal to pom, scope is equal to import, et voila. And now I'm going to add the Spring Cloud function web support here. So Spring Cloud function web. And we're going to create a very simple uppercase example here. OK, uppercase. Where's my Java code? Here we are. And I'm going to create a bean of type Java 8 util function. So function of flux of string that takes an input of publisher of type string and that returns an output of publisher of string, right? So uppercase and return new Java util function, function. And this is just a simple function. It's a, you know, it's Spring Boot, so you could do anything you wanted to. You could send an email, you could do uh, pro resize an image, anything that you wanted to do outside of the traditional request response flow, you could do that here. So I'm going to say return uh, string flux dot map x x dot uh, to uppercase. So I'm just doing a very simple example here. I'm just replacing, uh, you know, I'm taking the in input string and turning it into another thing. That's my whole function. And now I'll go to here. I'll say Maven clean package, and I'm going to use Project Riff. Uh, which is running in the background here. I've got project riff. I can say riff list, show me any of the uh, functions that I've got deployed. Nothing yet. There's my uh, built artifact. And I'm going to look for my existing grep riff uh, publish examples. And I'll say, let's do 8714. So 8714. There we go. So I'm going to say run this program. Uh, and that's going to run this. Uh, it's going to deploy this function. This is the actual command that got run. It's riff create Java minus A pointing to the jar. Give it an input name, and the input name is the Kafka topic on which the uh, messages arrive. And I'm telling it to use this function in this Java class right here, right? And that's it. So once I do that, I have riff list, and riff list shows me that I've got a function that's up. It's called. It's got 19 seconds, and now I can publish some data to it. So minus 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 content hyphen type equals application JSON, and the payload is going to be uh, you know bonjour devox France. And uh, oh, I want to do lowercase here because we're doing uppercase. And uh, I'm going to ask for a reply. So publish uh, and input will be up. So that's actually going to post to the function as a service gateway endpoint. Go to the Kafka topic. Kafka will then deliver the message to a function instance. And I'll get the response back here. Ooh. You can do the same thing. All right. <laughs> hey, man, that was a rush. <laughs> Mes amis, uh, just, je, just, just, yeah, sorry. je vous remercie d'être venu. Merci beaucoup. Si vous avez, si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à le poser à mon ami ici, parce que moi, yeah. j'ai me casser. Yeah, yes, Merci he, beaucoup. He, 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 <laughs>